So in this video, I want to address one of those big questions within the abortion debate that people generally consider to be just very, very difficult to answer. So specifically, I'm going to be looking at penalties. If there is to be a restriction of abortion, how should we penalize those individuals who are responsible for a violation of this restriction? Now, this is obviously something which deserves consideration. It's clearly something that we're going to have to think about if we are to extend the equal protection of rights to our prenatal population. But it's also an inquiry that I think a lot of prenatal rights activists have been unable to resolve even for themselves and have had an unfortunate habit of kind of just trying to avoid and discreetly sweep under the rug. So as I proceed, I want to do so in a fashion which will maximize the educational value of my video and help these individuals who are struggling with this question to come to a logical conclusion and to be able to defend their position using the facts that I provide. So if this starts to sound like a history lesson, I do apologize, but in order to accomplish this, I'm going to have to provide quite a bit of background information, and I hope that the facts I give you are still enlightening, educational, useful, and yeah, to a lesser degree, entertaining. So to begin, I think that we can start our dialogue by looking at the history of this discussion since Roe v. Wade, because if you do that, I think that what you're going to find is that intelligent, legally savvy, and educated individuals who nevertheless adhere to the pro-choice doctrine have always had a sort of tendency to phrase the question or frame the discussion in a fashion which falsely insinuates that if there is to be a restriction of abortion, penalties for violating this restriction must specifically be targeted at the consumers and not just the providers within the abortion industry. But of course, this is completely false. It's not true. It runs entirely contrary to the historical record. Because if you do look at those restrictions which were in place prior to Roe v. Wade, what you're going to find is that in more cases than not, penalties for violating this restriction were specifically targeted at the abortionist, the physician, the doctor, whatever you want to call this individual, the person who was handing abortions out, was the one held responsible and not the individual terminating her pregnancy. So it's not at all necessary for a law restricting abortion to target the woman obtaining an abortion. It's very, very possible for this law to only target the physicianist or the abortionist, whatever you want to call them. So the question now becomes, why do pro-choice activists feel obliged to insinuate otherwise? Well, it's necessary, and this goes all the way back to Roe v. Wade, because in order to apply the Griswold Doctrine, this is exactly what has to be true. If these laws can be enforced without targeting the consumer, then it is very possible for a law restricting abortion to exist without violating the Griswold Doctrine. So this is one of those statements which requires some background information because not everyone's familiar with what the Griswold Doctrine entails. But basically, in the late 1960s, we had a case which came to the United States Supreme Court dealing with state-level restrictions on the use of contraceptives. And this case was called Griswold v. Connecticut. Now, Griswold v. Connecticut was a groundbreaking case in that it established the right to privacy. Now, the justices who wrote the opinion for this case do recognize that nowhere within the letter of the law is there a specific mention of the right to privacy. Search the Constitution, the word privacy isn't going to appear. But they argued, and I agree, that there is nevertheless a penumbral right to privacy. So what's a penumbral right? Well, a penumbral right is a right which, while not specifically mentioned within the letter of the law, nevertheless flows from the provisions of the Constitution and is congruent with the spirit of that document. So, for example, we have a right to squeeze our fingers. We've discussed this in previous videos. But nowhere within the Constitution does it specifically say that we have a right to squeeze our finger. Instead, we deduce that we have a right to squeeze our finger from the fact that there is a notion of liberty in the Constitution. The right to squeeze your finger logically flows from the notion of liberty, which is given specific attention within the Constitution. So even though there is not a direct mention of the right to squeeze our finger, we know that we have that right. It is therefore a penumbral right. And just as we have a penumbral right to squeeze our finger, we have a penumbral right to privacy. Now, what does any of this have to do with a law restricting the use of contraceptives or abortion? Well, according to the justices who were on the Supreme Court at the time of Griswold v. Connecticut, laws restricting the use of contraceptives were in violation of our right to privacy because in order to enforce these laws, it was necessary to create some kind of a task force that would invade the sacred ground of people's marital bedchambers in search of telltale signs that contraceptives had been used. 
Now, this is obviously not the case. Clearly, this is an example of judicial activism, and the court at this time was very, very famous for legislating from the bench, but that's what the Supreme Court said, and this laid the foundation for the later case of Roe v. Wade. But there's a problem with this for pro-choice activists. If you read the opinion for the case of Griswold versus Connecticut, what you will find is that the justices in that case very, very, very specifically state that there is nothing wrong with those laws that target the providers by restricting the sale or the manufacture of contraceptives, and that only those laws which targeted the consumer by restricting specifically the use of contraceptives were in violation of our right to privacy. So if they want to apply the Griswold Doctrine to the abortion debate, it is necessary for pro-choice activists to falsely insinuate or outright claim that a restriction on abortion must specifically target the consumers. And again, this is simply not the case. Now, a pro-choice activist might respond by saying that those restrictions prior to Roe v. Wade, which targeted the providers, were ineffective and that they didn't reduce de facto abortion rates, but that they succeeded in driving thousands upon thousands of women to their deaths in a network of back alley butcher shops. But I've uploaded previous videos which, using statistical and pro-choice sources, demonstrate that this is not the case. Those will be linked in the information bar along with some other useful bits of information, other sources to look at, and these kinds of things. So now it's time to matriculate. We have seen that it is possible to effectively reduce abortion rates and restrict that operation without targeting the consumers for penalties when the restriction is violated. It's very possible simply to target the providers, the abortionists, the doctors, the physicians. The question now becomes whether or not we should target the consumers. Should we penalize consumers of abortion if we are to restrict it, or should we, as we did prior to Roe v. Wade, specifically aim penalties for the violation of a restriction on abortion at the providers? I'm going to argue in favor of the latter course of action, and in order to do so, it's once again necessary to provide quite a bit of background information going back as early as the Enlightenment, and very briefly, a little bit before that. Because in the early modern period, people were still adhering to this Christian doctrine of retributive justice as a part of the divine scheme of things. They said that we must punish criminals because they are sinful and they have to be chastised for their criminal activity. This was also taken up in a more secular sense by people such as Locke, who took the theory of retributive justice and combined it with the social contract theory and said that punishments were a tool for society to vent its moral outrage on these individuals who had violated the social contract. However, in the Enlightenment, people such as Beccaria and Bentham came out and they examined the theory of retributive justice and what they found is that it doesn't work. Whenever you are using retributive justice to punish criminals and not to prevent crime, what you run into is moral judgments. The judge is trying to decide how much punishment these criminals deserve. And as a result, penalties for violating the law become extremely arbitrary. And since there is no consistency, there is no effectiveness for the reduction of future crimes. Thus, by using retributive justice, we ensure that these individual rights are going to be continuously violated. However, if we adopt a more utilitarian approach to crime and punishment, it is possible to better society by preventing crime and protecting individual rights through penalties that are consistent and at the same time not so severe that they inflict unnecessary suffering. Now with this being said, in this approach to crime and punishment, any chastisement which was unnecessary for the prevention of crime was irrational. And this is the ideology which forms the backbone of all modern legal systems throughout the Western world. So we should apply the exact same principle to abortion that we apply to all other acts of violence or all other crimes or all other violations of individual rights. We should not apply the antiquated, antediluvian theory of retributive justice. Instead, we should take a more utilitarian approach. Because the purpose of our law should be to protect our rights by preventing crimes and not to punish criminals. Punishing criminals serves no pragmatic purpose for society and doesn't make any of us any safer or more secure in our persons and in our rights. Therefore, any form of punishment which is superfluous or unnecessary is irrational and should be rejected. 
Now, what does that tell us about the abortion industry and about restricting the performances of abortion? Well, we now know that it's very possible to reduce de facto abortion rates through de jure restrictions, which do not target consumers. In other words, those laws which target consumers are unnecessary, they are superfluous, therefore irrational, under the ideology promoted by Bentham Beccaria and other Enlightenment reformers, the uh, philosophy that forms the foundation for our current legal system, and therefore we know that if there is to be a restriction of abortion, penalties for violating this restriction must specifically target the physicians and not the women. So when someone asks you, how are you going to punish a woman if she has an abortion, if you get your way and pass this restriction, the answer is, we're not. It's not necessary. We can prevent abortion without penalizing women who terminate their pregnancies.